Hello, and welcome to Open Line. I'm Starlene Stringer. Well, mosquito season is upon us, and we want to help you protect yourself and your family. On the program today, we are going to learn about the concerns and explain steps you can take to reduce the risk. Our guests are City of Irving Mosquito Control Coordinator Thomas Dickens and Dallas County Health and Human Services Medical Director Dr. Christopher Perkins. Thank you both so much for being here for this important topic. Thank you for having me. Glad You're to be here. welcome. Thank you. Well, we're going to start, Thomas, with the first question, and that's traps. We're going to talk about those because they're already out, and we know you're already seeing results. So, what kind of findings are you getting compared to last year? Well, according from last year, we are getting a lot of mosquitoes right now. Because of the temperature, we're not seeing a lot of mosquito virus in Irving, uh, like West Nile. But uh, we are seeing a bit more mosquitoes at this time than we were last year, and that is most likely because the very mild winter that we've had. Interesting. Yeah, and I want Dr. Perkins to talk a little bit more about that. Um, because of the very mild winter that we experienced, what are the predictions for this season for mosquitoes? Is it going to be really bad? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, mosquito season is unpredictable as far as intensity and severity. So that's why we do mosquito surveillance activity. So as far as uh, predicting, I, I will not make a prediction, but I can guarantee you that the mosquitoes will be out, whether they be highly abundant or a few. The fact is we need to take personal protection to pre prevent getting bitten by mosquitoes. Thank you. And so Thomas, you put all these traps out there. What happens to those mosquitoes you catch? The first thing we do is we send them, we, we collect them, we send them to the, uh, the county, the lab. What they'll do is they'll identify the mosquitoes, they'll separate uh, the females and the males, they'll give us a count of those, uh, they'll, they'll identify the species of mosquitoes, and then they'll send them to a different lab and they'll have them tested for diseases like West Nile. Well, speaking of labs, Dr. Perkins, we recently got a look inside the Dallas County lab. Tell us exactly what happens there. Okay, in regards to human surveillance activity as relates to mosquito arboborne viruses as well as mosquito uh, traps and determining whether they're positive for West Nile virus. At the Dallas County Lab, we have the capability to not only do a mosquito testing, look for West Nile viruses as well as other related viruses, whether it be chikungunya, dengue, but as far as the human side, we're able to get specimens that are from clinical uh, people that are symptomatic, uh, for example, with Zika, with recent travel history, mm -hmm. if they meet qualifications, then their actual specimen can be analyzed at the, at the Dallas County lab versus a commercial lab. So that's something that's, that's being considered based on when they follow up with their doctor based on symptoms and travel history. Okay. And I want to go back to you, Thomas, for a second, and we're going to talk about spraying a little bit later, but I know there's another way you're actually kind of fighting mosquitoes, and that's with fish. What's that all about? Well, the idea is to get a biological control, which will last longer in the environment. Uh, fish will be able to breed in the water that we put it in, uh, which will last typically the entire summer. Uh, and one of these mosquito fish can eat, uh, I believe it's 100 mosquito larvae in one day. Now, if you put, uh, let's say you have an acre of, of stagnant water that uh, can allow a uh, fish habitat, mm -hmm. uh, if you put in uh, about 1,000 fish, that's gonna last and, and pretty much decimate all the mosquito larvae. So it's a very economic and uh, very beneficial for the environment to use mosquito fish when applicable. So you've had them out there for a few weeks now. Can you tell if they're working? We, well, we're gonna set more traps in that area and over time we'll see the difference. Um, well, we should see uh, less mosquitoes caught in those traps. Right now it's just too early to see the, those results. Uh, we, we're gonna be trapping that area again this week and hopefully we'll see a reduction in the number of mosquitoes. Okay, that sounds good. We sure hope so. Well, Dr. Perkins, with West Nile being a very big concern in our community, can you tell us what the symptoms are, what you can expect, what we should be aware of? Okay, at, at this point in time, in 2017, unfortunately, the viruses in our county, today we've had seven positive mosquito traps across the county uh, with West Nile virus. Let's keep in mind that West Nile virus is a bird disease, so the virus is again, actually getting acquired from the birds to the mosquito, and when she has to have, to have subsequent feeding, she looks for another meal. And unfortunately, we might be in her line of sight. So if someone is infected with West Nile virus, let's keep in mind, 80% of individuals that are infected with West Nile virus would develop no symptoms. Hmm. Of the 20% that become symptomatic, the vast majority will have flu-like symptoms such as fever, achiness, fatigue, maybe loss of appetite, may have a rash. 
And of those that become symptomatic, less than 1% will advance to severe disease, which could be meningitis, encephalitis, or paralysis. That's called West Nile neuroinvasive disease. So the main thing is to take action to avoid breeding mosquitoes. Subsequently, they have to feed and protect yourself by creating a barrier between you and the mosquito by using long clothes, loose fitting, insect repellent, so on and so forth. Yeah, let's talk more about that. In fact, we'll go back and forth and let you both kind of piggyback and talk about these things. It's the four Ds. We hear it all the time in news, on radio, in commercials. Everyone's saying four Ds, four Ds. So we'll come to you first and let's just break it down and talk about uh, one of those four Ds and that would be dusk and dawn. Yeah, you're gonna have the most mosquito activity, meaning the mosquitoes are gonna be more actively looking to uh, for a blood meal and a, a person at dusk and dawn. So those are the time periods when we want to be outside to enjoy uh, the cooler weather in the summer, but it's the most dangerous time for us in terms of getting bit by mosquito. So it's very important to take precautions when you're outside at those times. I see, and then Dr. Perkins, the next on that list is dress. Yes, unfortunately, you know, we live in paradise called Texas, <laughs> and we share paradise with other critters, particularly mosquitoes. So even when it's July and 105 degrees in the shade, you need to create a barrier between you and the mosquito by wearing long sleeves, long pants, loose fitting, lightly colored. And also that will, if it's, if it's loose fitting clothing, if she lands upon your, your body, she'll have, a, have to extend a proboscis, her, her needle to bite you because you have loose fitting clothes on. And by all means, then that takes us to the next step is to apply an insect repellent. Make yourself less attractive to her by uh, using DEET or some other EPA approved insect repellent. Good, so tell us a little bit more about DEET. Well, first, go back to that word you used. You, I could see how you looked. You used that big word and then you went, um, the little needle. You broke that <laughs> down for me, thank you. Yes. What was the word you used so I can sound official when I say the it? Proposis. The proboscis. The proboscis. So the proboscis or the little needle. Right. Um, so to even get her to not even get that far, we can consider using DEET. Tell us about DEET. Is there a particular kind we should get? Because you see it listed in products all the time, but is it enough or is it too much? Tell us about DEET. Well, DEET was uh, created in 1946 by the U.S. military particularly the Army, and in the 1950s it became available to the general population. And since then, so we've had uh, countless years to show that it's been proven to be effective in repelling mosquitoes. There are other options that are available, but whatever choice you use, make sure it's EPA approved and that you apply it based on label instructions. Thank you. And Thomas, I want to come back to you for the last one, and that would be drain. What do they mean by that? Well, most of your mosquitoes are your backyard mosquitoes. Uh, that, that are gonna affect the human population. So w after a rain, particular gutters or any kind of debris, trash that's sitting in your yard, that anything that can hold water, anything as, even as small as a uh, bottle cap uh, can produce mosquitoes. So what you wanna do is go out and drain these things, your bird baths, your, um, uh, the little pans that sit under your flower pots, anything that hold water for any kind of time, go ahead and drain those. If you do that, uh, you're gonna re significantly reduce the population of mosquitoes and by doing that, reduce your chances of getting bit by mosquito. Makes sense, thank you, thank you so much. I wanna come back to you, Dr. Perkins, and talk a little bit more about DEET, because it seems kinda of silly. Some people will say, well, why would you ask that? But then yet it comes up time and time again. Should you put the DEET on before you put on clothing or after? Should it be just on the skin that's exposed or on the clothes too? Okay. DEET is uh, an insect repellent that should be applied to exposed skin, okay? So it's, not recommended to apply DEET to your body and then put clothing on top. You, know, you put the DEET on the exposed skin, whether it be if you have short sleeves on, it's gonna be the forearm that's visible that you apply the DEET to, to your neck, uh, dab a little on your cheeks, your forehead, avoid your eyes, nose, and mouth, and then you can apply the DEET to your clothing. However, keep in mind there are label instructions, so I encourage everyone to read the label instruction and apply based on what's recommended based on the product that you've uh, chosen. And also, I have a four-year-old child, so when you have a small child, small child in your life, should there be any difference that you put on DEET on yourself or that child? Are there any tips we need to know about applying DEET to children? The American Academy of Pediatrics and, the, and uh, other programs or uh, organizations like Family Medicine recommend that DEET is approved for two months and older. Okay. Okay, so it's even a full for infants. And for those that are younger than two months, you know, mosquito netting or or other ways to create a barrier between that infant or avoid taking that child, a young child out of, when the mosquitoes are most active. But nevertheless, label instructions will be your best guidance or consult with your doctor. 
Thank you so much. Now, Thomas, with the concern of disease, a lot of people may want to see you out spraying with your trucks every day, every night. We're, we're not seeing that right now. How does the city determine when to spray? Well, we go based on our surveillance, first of all. When we have disease in mosquitoes that we're finding, we'll go out and spray the area that we set that trap. Now, the West Nile mosquitoes, they have a, range, a flight range of up to half a mile. So that's kind of the area that we're going to be spraying is a half mile radius from where we set that trap. Uh, that's, that's a good way to do it. That's what science tells us to do. So that's what we will go ahead and do. Um, we can spray when we have just high numbers, uh, but we haven't really seen that to the point where we, need, we can go out and spray at this time of year. And so how do we find out when and where you will be spraying? You can go to the city of Irving, irvingfightsthebite.org. Uh, that's when we'll post uh, each and every time we'll, we are uh, scheduled for spraying. We'll show you the area uh, via a map and we'll tell you the times that uh, you can expect to see us out there. And of course, people always have lots of questions when it comes to spraying, um, like if there should be a concern about you actually doing it or not. I mean, how does it affect people and pets? It is recommended that people stay indoors while we're out there uh, spraying in that neighborhood. Uh, you don't have to be indoors all night or anything like that, just basically while we drive by and the, the, you can see the, the mosquito mist in the air, uh, which lasts about two to five minutes typically. Uh, so it's not a very long time. It is a good idea to put your pets up when you, when you can, but there is no, there's no major effect on pets uh, anyway. You might want to go ahead and uh, change out your dog's bowl if we're going to be there. Uh, but again, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not crucial or critical that that's done. It's just a, a precaution on, on, on uh, owner's part to do such a thing. And if for some reason that doesn't happen, should people panic or be concerned? Not and if all. they walk outside and they didn't know you were spraying and they see it? Right, not at all. Uh, the the uh, pesticide that we use is such low quantities, it's really only going to affect mosquitoes. The time that we spray aren't times when there's um, bees and other beneficial insects that are out flying around. It's just the mosquitoes that's, that's the target for spraying. So there's really no concern uh, that people should have when it comes to, to, to the bees or to the uh, effects of, of dogs or even people. Our, our systems will uh, get, get rid of any toxin and especially the uh, pesticide that we use quite easily and quickly. That's good to know, because I, I confess, I, I've experienced that, walking outside, not knowing, picking up my child from the yeah. sitter and going, oh my gosh, yes. that's that spray truck. And keep in mind, the, the people that, like me, they're out spraying, uh -huh. we deal with it all the time, mm, and we don't true. have any, any effects. I've never gotten sick from pesticide that uh, I've been using. You look nice, you look healthy, that yes, makes me feel healthy, good, thank you. <laughs> so, why is there no aerial spraying right now? That's a good question. Uh, it is controversial, people are nervous about that. When you do aerial spraying, you're gonna cover a big area, Nothing can escape that. Uh, so there is some concern about other things uh, uh, like the bees and, the, and the, the butterflies and things like that. Um, we just haven't hit a threshold here in the city of Irving that the council and the city manager and, and the people that will make that decision feel like it was, it's been necessary enough. Um, and uh, in the past also, when it's come up, you get feedback from, from the public to say, hey, we don't want this done and we work for the public, so we're gonna do what the public wants. Of course, after the fact, when our opportunity to get aerial spraying passed, many of the people in the public said, well, why didn't we spray? Everybody else sprayed. Well, if that's your, your concern, now is the time to contact your councilman or city hall to let them know I'm for this or I'm against this. It's, it's very important because we're talking about human life here. We're talking about a, debil a debilitating disease called West Nile. That's not fun to get. You don't wanna see your loved one go through that. So make a choice now. Do you want aerial spraying to happen if we have a situation like 2012 where we have a lot of people getting sick and a lot of people to potentially get sick? It's up to the public to make this decision as well. Good information. And you know, speaking of calls, there's also a mosquito hotline. When should we use it? Uh, that mosquito hotline is all the time. It's 24-7. It's a hotline. So we are available all year long. Anytime you have a concern, a question, or even a comment, go ahead and call that hotline and somebody will get back to you as soon as they can. Thank you, and that number is on the screen, so people are going, good, thank you so much yes, for providing that call. information. Okay, so Dr. Perkins, we are learning a lot about Zika virus. A lot of those cases are imported, they say. So what do they mean specifically when they say a case is imported? Uh, based on the fact that the virus has been circulating in Central and South America, and unfortunately, since we met last year, uh, we've had local transmission of Zika in South Florida and also South Texas. So that's what we meant by travel, that those mosquitoes in those, in those areas are carriers of the Zika virus. 
And there's different ways it's spread, I'm told, in addition to mosquitoes, it can also be spread by sexual contact? Right, the vast majority of Zika is gonna be via mosquito, however, uh, there are other means of um, transmission, whether it be a blood transfusion, tissue transplantation, as well as sexual activity. And what are some of the symptoms people should look for? Uh, unfortunately, it can be confused with other, whether it be the flu or whether it be a common cold. Uh, the fact is it's gonna be more like red eye conjunctivitis, uh, fever, fatigue, uh, muscle aches, so it can overlap with uh, regular flu. But the key factor is to determine travel history because we know our local mosquitoes at this time are not carriers of the Zika virus. So with the increasing temperatures, increased activity of our local mosquitoes, particularly the 80s species that can potentially carry Zika with the people going back and forth, citizens going to visit friends, family, business across uh, international boundaries, South Florida, South Texas, it'll be a matter of time that we're gonna have local transmission because once mosquito here in Dallas County when she has to feed, she might feed on someone that has Zika. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one thing we have to keep in mind that the vast majority of people with Zika infection are asymptomatic. Wow, and we also hear a lot about birth defects. So what kind of advice do you have to offer to pregnant women? Well, fortunately, we've been an, an analyzing the situation and yes, there's a threat of birth defects in pregnant women as far as their fetuses and, and, and children that are born, but it's a very small number. However, that number, if it's actually your child, that's 100% in that case. So we're recommending if someone has to travel to an area where Zika is circulating, they may, might need to delay or defer or avoid going to that area if possible. If they have to go, to use personal protection, talk it over with their medical provider, and, and take the appropriate action if they have to travel to those areas. So I was asking specifically about pregnant women before, but a lot of people are planning summer vacations and that may include international travel. So what advice do you have for them? Well, and we, we're always in consultation with uh, the World Health Organization, CDC, uh, the Pan American Health Organization. So we have a gauge of what's going on in those areas. We have a travel medicine clinic. So in addition to preparing for potential mosquito viruses that you might encounter in those areas, make sure you're current on your vaccinations because that's why we have a travel medicine clinic because when you go to an area, you make sure you're current on your vaccines so that you won't go and be exposed to something, bring something back such as mumps or measles. That would not be good. So Thomas, tell me, how do you actually work with Dallas County and the state? Well, right now uh, we work very closely to Dallas County. Uh, they give us a lot of really good information, tips, things have, uh, like that. Uh, but uh, they also test our mosquitoes for us and identify our mosquitoes. Um, but yeah, we, we do really count on the county for guidance and advice when it comes to uh, mosquito control and what's new, what's going on, uh, how we're doing compared to other cities and things like that. Wonderful. I want to go back to you, Dr. Perkins, because we've talked a bit about Zika virus in West Nile, but I know you wanted to talk about some other concerns people need to be aware of too, including food safety. So what do people know, need to know about that right about now? Well, keep in mind, you know, it's, it's getting nice and comfortable, pleasant breeze, uh, mm -hmm. nice, uh, cool evenings, mornings, but it's going to be a matter of time where it's going to be quite hot. Right. And as we go out and we encounter, you know, living here in paradise at the park, at the, the water park, uh, at the, the zoo, and we carry our food and stuff, but we have to be concerned about food safety issues. So keep your hot foods hot and your cold food cold. Keep your cooked food from your raw food. Do not cross connect, contaminate. So these are things that I want the citizens of Dallas County to be aware of that there are other things that you need to be concerned about in addition to mosquitoes. Also, water safety issues. So for example, when you're, if you have young uh, toddlers or young children, make sure that you, encounter, that you plan bathroom breaks. Mm -hmm. Remove them from the pool and let them go take care of their bathroom needs and not use that particular pool yes. as a possible uh, source of infection. So those are things that I want everyone to be aware of. You can see, get additional information at our website. Also check at the State Health Department website as well as CDC. Interesting. You know, I, I have a cousin that works for the CDC and she was visiting from Atlanta and it was funny. I took her somewhere, I won't say where, it was not here in Irving, but she looked at the little kid thing they had out and it had water and all the kids were like, ooh, water. And she said, 
that's a health concern. Why is that water, that water's not going anywhere. It's not, that's the same water going around and around. And she said, don't let your daughter play with that. So parents do have to be aware of things like that. So I'm glad you brought up the water and what can be in it. Now you talked a bit about picnics, but tell us about grilling because a lot of people are ready to start barbecuing. What are the health safety concerns when it comes to grilling? Well, when it comes to food in general, exactly. you want to you know, purchase your food, collect your food. You want to separate your food you want to clean your food and then you want to keep it you want to cook your food and then you want to chill your food so you, one thing that we might oftentimes uh, lose track of is that we have our raw meats in particular we're talking about grilling so you take your, your your tray with your raw meats you put that meat on the grill and then when the oh, yeah. when the meat is prepared and thoroughly cooked then you take that container that you had the raw meat on, now you put your cooked meat on, now it's, it's cross-contaminated. Possibly yeah. a source of infection with salmonella, shigella, and so forth. So we need to make sure that we keep compartmentalized and keep our cooked foods separate from our raw foods because that can lead to foodborne illnesses. Now let's say people watch this show and then they don't take your advice, they don't do what you say not to do, and they get sick. At what point should someone seek medical attention? Well, with uh, gastroenteritis, so that's going to be a stomach or foodborne illness that can result in vomiting, throwing up, uh, diarrhea, loose stools, and so forth. Then can put you at risk for dehydration and, and low blood pressure and dizziness, faintness, hardness, etc. So consult with your physician. You yes. might need to have some uh, uh, maybe IV given as well as antibiotics to see based, based on what the infection might be. It would be so much cheaper just to take your advice that you're offering for free right here today instead of getting a hospital bill. Okay, so you mentioned pools a bit when you were talking about young children and making sure they get out and go to the bathroom regularly. But for adults too, what's the concern when it comes to pool safety? Because sometimes whether you're trying to get in your mouth or not, it can be ingested. Right, so hopefully that the pool is being maintained properly, the water park, as far as the filters, the chlorine, and so forth. So it's gonna be a partnership that that particular business, location, park, et cetera, are maintaining the pool based on recommendations of their uh, licensed entity, as well as we're taking personal responsibility by not getting into the pool and drinking the, the pool water, but actually enjoying the water by swimming and make sure that we have appropriate uh, lessons that we can adequately uh, survive and avoid trouble in, in those type of situations. Okay, and I know Dallas County does a lot of tracking. So say you do get sick, should we contact the county and let you know, or do our doctors do that? Well, you can contact your, your city. Let's like say, for example, if it's uh, associated with a particular restaurant or some, of some sort, you can notify your, your city code enforcement, health department, whatever the situation may be in your particular community. In regards to your doctor, your doctor would draw tests, blood, uh, specimens and so forth, that will be reported to the health department and we'll do a public health follow-up related Good information. to that particular illness. Yes. Thank you. Great information. Now, Tom, let's, let's get back to talking about the mosquitoes, the Zika virus, and things like that for just a minute because I know you do have some resources available for residents like dunks. How do people go about getting those? There's a few ways you can get dunks. You can go to directly to City Hall. Uh, they'll direct you to the Parks and Rec desk, which you can get your dunks there. You can go to any of our rec centers uh, and you can also go, if you're a senior, to our Heritage Senior Center. Uh, at, that, at that location, if you're a re uh, senior, you can get the dunks and you can get off mosquito spray. Oh, nice. Or you can call me at our hotline, and, and if you can't make it to these uh, places, uh, me or one of my staff will come and give you the, uh, the dunks. Thomas delivers, I like that, yes, in more ways than one. Thank you so much, Thomas. You know what, But some people watching right now may say, okay, it's free, they know what off is, it's the spray, but they don't know what dunks are. So for those who aren't sure. familiar with dunks, what are they? Mosquito dunks is a larvicide. Uh, this, this is a pesticide that will, kill, uh, that will kill the mosquito larva in standing or stagnant water. Uh, even if you don't see currently mosquito larva, you can go ahead and treat your, your, uh, your flower pot pans, your bird baths, things like that. As long as it doesn't get washed away by heavy rain, these dunks will last up to 30 days. So it's a really great way to reduce uh, any kind of uh, mosquito larva in something that you cannot drain. So that's, uh, that'll be very helpful for most people. For sure. Now we talked a bit about Dallas County having a lab, but we, Irving has a lab too. Can we you do. tell us what you do there? Uh, we will test for West Nile virus in our lab. Uh, we can't identify the mosquitoes as of yet in, in Irving, but uh, we will take all the female mosquitoes out and we can test those for West Nile virus in our lab. Uh, you know, Dallas County lab and other labs, they can test for several different uh, arbor viruses. Our machine only tests for West Nile, but the good thing about that is we can know very quickly 
whether or not uh, somebody's backyard has mosquitoes in it that have West Nile virus. And we could respond to that very quickly to treat the, the area. Very good. Now, Dr. Perkins, we hear a lot about West Nile and we hear a lot about Zika, but are there other mosquito-borne illnesses that we need to be aware of? Yes, in regards to those uh, tropical regions, the Bahamas, Jamaica, uh, Fun places. Central, South America, <laughs> etc., there's chikungunya. Oh my. Which is a related virus to West Nile, as well as uh, there's dengue, there's yellow fever. So, in regards to someone returning to Dallas County with symptoms associated with a potential or possible mosquito bite, we're going to ask that clinician to check for dengue as well as chikungunya. Now, I'm glad you brought up yellow fever. If I'm not mistaken, I saw a press release just this week saying that the vaccine could possibly be running out. There could be a shortage. Is that true? Are you aware of anything about that? Uh, yes, in regards to yellow fever, uh, it's endemic and uh, it's present in other parts of the world, but fortunately we wiped it out here in North America, particularly the United States, because mm -hmm. of the vaccine. Uh, if we go back 150 years ago, yellow fever was all the way up into Philadelphia, New York City, okay. so it was, it was here in the United States. Uh, I've had my yellow fever vaccine. Me too. <laughs> uh, so, but unfortunately, there's a, a shortage of uh, manufacturers of the vaccine. So hopefully they're trying to make that correction so it can be available to others. Yeah, a lot of people are taking different trips, going out and working in the communities and going to other countries. And now they say, get the yellow, you know, but they can't get the vaccine if it's not available. So thank you for letting us know that is true, not just a rumor. And now, Thomas, we talked about protecting ourselves, and we've been doing that a lot today in the show. But what about our pets? Um, how do we protect them? The biggest thing is to eliminate standing water, to um, eliminate the breeding of mosquitoes in your yard. That's the biggest thing you can do to protect your pet. But another thing is to make sure that their water bowl is cleaned out, uh, that they have fresh water at least every two to three days. Uh, water bowls, uh, especially if you have these five gallon buckets of water that you think is convenient uh, for your pet to always have water in it. Uh, well, in the heat of the summer, that's gonna turn rancid really quick and it's gonna produce a lot of mosquitoes. Uh, it's dangerous for your dog because they can get heartworm from mosquito bites. Uh, so it's very important to help uh, keep that water clean for good, your animals. Good advice. And I'm going to come back to you for just a minute, Dr. Perkins, because why we have you here, I know there's another big concern right now. Dallas County has been responding to lots of cases of mumps. We haven't had any reported here in Irving, but they're nearby. So what should people know about that? Well, in regards to mumps, that was a childhood illness that used to be just rampant in the United States. So since uh, the mumps vaccine was introduced in 1967, we've had a 99% decline in mumps as far as occurring in child age population in the United States. So it's a very good vaccine. Uh, in regards to Dallas County, uh, we've had uh, roughly 81, 80-ish as far as the number of mumps cases in Dallas County. Some are connected like in the, the southern uh, cities, particularly City Hill. Uh, in regards to the mumps, we have a very high vaccination rate, and that's a good thing because of those children that have come down with the mumps, they've had a mild diversion of it, and they have, we've had 100% compliance as far as being current on the two-dose series. First dose is going to be 12 to 15 months as far as the child getting the first dose of the mumps. The second dose is going to be four to six years of age. So the vaccine is 88% effective if you have two doses of it. So that means that out of 100 individuals that are occurring with two doses, 12 of those are gonna still have some type of presentation associated with mump-like symptoms. So it's, not a, it's a good vaccine, but we might have to consider offering another dose somewhere later in the, in the uh, regimen cycle, maybe in the uh, late teens, early 20s. So with that being said, in an outbreak scenario, we offer a third dose to boost everyone's immunity so we can abort or, or end the, the particular outbreak that might be going on. Thank you. So we've covered a lot today. We've talked about mumps and West Nile and Zika and how do you say chicken gunya? Chicken gunya. Chicken gunya and many other things and what y'all are doing to make a difference and keep everyone safe, pets and people. So thank you both so much for being here. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for watching. I'm Starlene Stringer. Please be sure to join us live on Thursday, June 1st at 1.30 p.m. for our next edition of Open Line. We'll be talking about fun summer programs offered by the City of Irving. If you have questions, email them to ictn at cityofirving.org and we'll get answers for you on our next edition of Open Line. We'll see you then.